There is no denying that artificial intelligence, AI, is a super hot topic right now. So hot right now. In fact, whenever I made my first video on how I think AI is going to disrupt the legal industry, I had no idea how many people would watch it. I also had no idea how spicy the comment section would be, which has been really entertaining to see. I'll share with you one of those comments now. The maker of this video is just a bit dumb. Not his fault. He never learned business and economics, but he will never be a respectable or admirable lawyer because he'll never understand his clients and his own firm. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'll be fine. One thing that has been sort of insightful is seeing the reactions to this first video that I posted on AI, because it seems that there is, I don't wanna say a majority, but probably a, a significant minority that thinks that AI is eventually going to replace all lawyers. They took our job! I think this idea that in the future there's going to be AI lawyers or robot lawyers is just a consequence of bad timing. Had AI had enough time to basically be introduced to lawyers and then become a well-established legal and writing tool, I think most lawyers and even law students would see AI as the ability to be able to make your job easier and overall your life easier. But unfortunately, that's not really how the news was rolling out. I'm willing to bet that most lawyers and law students that are watching this video right now, that your first exposure to AI wasn't as a research and writing tool, but you most likely saw the headline from Do Not Pay's robot lawyer who was potentially going to try a criminal case. Spoiler alert, they never tried that case with a robot lawyer. But once those headlines started going viral, the damage was potentially already done, or at least the paranoia was already starting to set in. Because once you hear robot lawyer, it makes you wonder, is this the beginning of the end? So here are my thoughts on whether the human lawyer needs to be concerned about the potential robot lawyer. First things first, if you're a, let's call it a keyboard lawyer to where all you do is just legal research and writing, then I do think you need to be concerned about how AI is going to develop and ultimately affect your career. I went through in my original video that was sliding above earlier, the reasons why you should be concerned. So if you haven't watched that, check it out. There's no need to repeat it in this video. Now let's get to my second point, which I think is going to be the heart of what we're talking about today. And what I think is going to address a lot of concerns most lawyers have. If you're a lawyer that goes into the courtroom, meaning you leave that keyboard behind and you go and you start making arguments to a judge or a jury, then you're going to be fine. You don't need to be concerned about robot lawyers replacing you. I think in that sense, that type of concern is a complete overreaction to AI. I can hear the booze already, but stick with me here. I'm going to get a quick sip of tea and then I'm going to dive into my thought process. Ooh, that is piping hot. That is, whoo, I have some regrets about drinking that. So let's go ahead and support this concept that the courtroom lawyers shouldn't be concerned about being replaced by the robot lawyers. And the best example of this, I think, is the music industry, which has obviously been around for a very long time. When we listen to a song, whether it's the actual MP3 or a CD or streaming on Spotify, what we're listening to is often referred to as the most perfect version of the song. And I use the quotes intentionally because as I'll go through this example, you'll see why perfect can actually be extremely subjective. The reason why I say that you're likely listening to the perfect version of the song is because a lot of work went into perfecting the ultimate product that you're listening to. For example, in making the song, the artist was likely in a studio with incredible technology, fantastic acoustics, and the artist had the luxury of doing multiple takes over and over again until their delivery or maybe their singing was just right. And eventually the song is recorded and it's sent over to an engineer who can polish the entire thing off. And ultimately as the fan or the audience, what we're listening to is basically been the result of many, many hours, days or weeks or months. I don't know how long it takes to record a song or an album but a lot of work has gone into creating that finished product. Despite the fact the song we're listening to is most likely the best version of itself, 
we still go to concerts. We still go in environments to listen to different versions of that song when there's a risk of that song not living up to the perfection of the actual MP3 recording. I mean, people will spend exponentially more money on the concert than what they spent on the album itself in order to go listen to the less perfect version of the song that they can stream or play on the CD. Why is this? I like to think that we go to concerts because it's the possibility of a mistake happening or it's the flaws themselves that create an experience that's unique to the audience in that particular moment. I actually recently saw a post in a video where Taylor Swift performed in an absolute downpour. And I think the rain was so bad that it eventually it damaged her piano, maybe some other instruments as well, but she continued to perform with what she had. So it didn't go as intended, and it was far from probably the perfect version that's on her CD or her album that she released that people are listening to and streaming all the time. But despite it not being a perfect version, if you go through the comments on that video, everyone describes that performance as iconic. Some people are like, even though it was a downpour, even though it was raining, I would totally go through that again. I think this concert concept is going to be true with lawyers in the courtroom. Any practicing lawyer knows that whenever there's, let's say, a hearing, you're most likely going to file a motion or you're going to file a response to the motion or a reply to the response. You're going to put your arguments on paper first and then you're going to go argue that particular matter. So why do you even have to argue? Why is that in our system? It's because the argument, the performance itself has value. We've seen that in our legal industry and that's why we have those arguments. It's also why a lot of judges won't even read the fine-tuned, edited version of the motion and instead they'll issue their ruling sometimes just based on the argument alone because they get that gut feeling, that gut reaction. They are able to experience overall what is happening in that moment in the courtroom like a lot of fans experience during a concert so in my opinion effective lawyering whether it's a human or a robot all comes down to attention and engagement and in that department flawed humans will always have the upper hand on ai and robots people either subconsciously or knowingly compare themselves to other people it's just a natural part of interacting with another human and so if you have a let's say a juror in the jury box they're most likely thinking to themselves i hate public speaking we all know that that is the number one fear even above death so either actively or subconsciously that juror is going to see a lawyer arguing a case and can't help but think and start comparing that if they were in that same position they would hate it so when one person sees another person overachieving that's impressive because we can't help but compare ourselves as the barometer and as the baseline of what is going to be normal and if something is impressive to someone and that captures and holds attention. On the flip side though, if somebody else sees somebody underachieving, then that can also elicit a ton of different emotions that again, captures attention. Meanwhile, if I pull my phone out and I open up a calculator app and start putting in some form of a complex math equation, well, it may be initially kind of cool to see the calculator solve that problem, but it's not gonna take long for me to get bored and to not have that level of excitement. And once I lose that excitement and that intrigue, and at that point, it loses my attention. So like the MP3 that may be perfect to listen to, a robot lawyer may be saying all the right things, but if nobody is listening, if the jury and or the judge is tuned out, then effectively, the robot lawyer is saying nothing. So look, maybe it really comes down to perspective. If you're the courtroom lawyer who's making the argument, you could see 
AI as the tool to help you make that argument that you ultimately deliver as a human to another human. But maybe from the AI perspective, the human is the tool to help deliver the argument that AI is helping to formulate so that there can still be that human to human connection. Which perspective is going to be right? It doesn't matter. As long as we are clear that the audience is the one who dictates the best way to deliver the message you're trying to convey. So all of this is to say that if you're a lawyer that goes into the courtroom, especially my trial lawyers, don't be afraid of AI. And if you're a lawyer that is afraid to go into the courtroom because you're afraid that you may make some mistakes, well, it's those mistakes that may actually be your secret weapon. Now, this is just one lawyer's opinion. Let me know what your thoughts, comments, and concerns are in the comment section down below.